Good morning. It's May 14th and it is Mother's Day 2017 and I want to wish all mothers a happy Mother's Day. I know that your uh, pastors will be giving messages on mothers today and I'm going to go in a different direction this morning but I do want to make acknowledgement of the mothers and the great things that they have done in this world to bring up children, good godly children and tell you thank you very much. Any mother that has raised their children in godly ways thank you very much for what you have done in behalf of God and all those that live around your children. Now, if you have your Bibles today, turn to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, if you will, chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 2 to 6. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. I'm going to read that this morning. Then we're going to a message that I want to bring you uh, about the Apostle Paul and things to come. Now, in verse uh, 2 of chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, it starts out as this. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Repu uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Make full proof of thy ministry. In Paul's writing when he wrote this, he was preparing for his death. In other words, Paul was in jail. He was in a cell. And he was writing this preparing for his death. In other words, he wanted to give the best instructions that he could give to the church, the body of Christ, if you will. He wanted to do his very best. And I imagine that Paul prayed earnestly to try to get in touch with the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit would lead and give Paul the words that he needed to write to the church as this was his final words. We went over to Rome and we visited the cell that Paul wrote this out of. And you know, it was a small little room and it was made of stone, had a stone floor, stone wall, stone ceiling, had a small little hole that was in the top. There were lower food in there. Paul spent two years in that cell. And I imagine that, yes, he had all this uh, atmosphere that inspired him to write, if you would, but the only thing that really would help him with the most powerful words that would mean the most to the church would be the Holy Spirit. Paul was in this cell. He was sitting there, I imagine, with this little candle or this little lighter, if you will, and he would sit by the candlelight and he would think and he would write and he would pray and he would pray and he would write and he would pray and he would write until finally the words came out just as Paul wanted them to come out as the Holy Spirit told him, this is what I want you to present. This is what I want to become the epistle. This is what I want the church to read for generations and generations and generations to come. And Paul finally got it right. Today we're going to take a look at what Paul wrote and these words and what they'll mean. And if we are in a place and time where these words are being fulfilled in our culture, in our world today, in other words, are we seeing what Paul prophesied in that cell 2,000 years ago when he wrote these words? Are we seeing things materialize in that direction? And folks, I believe that we are. Now, Paul realized that he was giving his final words to the church, so they became very important to him. And Paul wrote in verse 2, for us to stay with the Word. In other words, it is our job to stay with the Word of God is what Paul is trying to instruct us most of all with. Now, again, let's go to verse 2 and read it. Verse 2, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy says this, Preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all, what? Long suffering, long suffering. That's something that we need to understand today, folks. We have to go through long suffering and doctrine, or teaching, if you will. In other words, for us to teach and preach and give the Word of God as it is written, we're going to have to suffer to do so. There's going to be a time where we're going to have to go through our churches declining. Our preachers are going to see people not coming as much as they used to. We're going to see that people are not wanting to hear the the true, raw gospel of Jesus Christ, if you will. They're going to want their ears tickled. They're going to want to feel good. And they're going to start to separate from the church and not no longer be a part of what God had established and what God had ordained 2,000 years ago when the church began. We're going to see a time when this develops and when this comes about. But Paul is telling us in verse 2, no matter what the rest of the people do, you stick with the Word of God. And and brothers and sisters in Christ today, I want to tell you, 
What Paul wrote is the most important thing in your Christian life. Today, stick with the Word of God. I read, I preach, I teach only out of the King James Version Bible. You say, Brother Marty, is that important? It is absolutely the most important thing that I can tell you today. The Old King James Version Bible is one that has been proven and established to be the true Word of God. The other Bibles, they have, I could go into a history of things that will take me hours. But you have to trust me. They have things that they have added, things they have taken away. All but the King James. The Bible is the King James Bible. There is no other Bible. I can honestly tell you that today. Now, stick with it is what Paul is telling us. Stay with it and read it. No matter what the world does, no matter what direction the churches seem to be going in, when they're standing up and shouting and screaming and hollering, instead of preaching the gospel of about a person being lost and how they can be saved, when they're doing that, you stick with what the Bible says and you preach and you teach how a person can be saved. Okay? Now, we see this in verse 2. Paul tells us this. He is, he is earnest about this simply because these are some of the last things that he ever wrote while he was on this earth of what the Holy Spirit had given him to write. In other words, he is giving what the Holy Spirit gave him to write to the church as the last information that we will receive as the church or the body of Christ. Stick with the Word of God is what it's saying. Now, you know, recently here, we had a local pastor that has a large mega church. And when I say large mega church, I think there's about four different branches in this particular city of uh, his church, which runs anywhere from four to five to six thousand people per church. Now, he made a decree in these churches just recently that they would no longer do Bible studies. In other words, they will go out and evangelize. But folks, how can you go out and evangelize something that you don't know what you're talking about? You have to study the Word of God. The Bible tells us that Jesus sat in the temples daily and He would teach. You have to study the Word of God to be able to go out and to evangelize. But people are getting now to a place where they no longer want to be taught what the Word of God says. They want to create an idealism, if you will, of who God is and what God should be so that we can be Christians that we want to be. In other words, God, you have to become what we are. And folks, God cannot do that. And Paul is instructing us not to ever ask God to do that because God is right and we are wrong. We do not have a concept of what real sin is. In fact, most people sin today and they don't even realize that that is sin until God reveals it to them and shows them in their heart and in their soul and their spirit, this is why this is sin. And then all of a sudden they understand and they say, I get it. I realize it. But we're starting to get away from the Word of God which teaches us what sin is. In other words, the Holy Spirit reveals things through the Word of God. Can He come up to us and just, boom, put something inside our head? Yes. But the Bible is what God uses as a tool to do that. In other words, Paul tells us, study and show thyself approved. A workman need not be ashamed. Be ashamed. And in other words, stand before God one day and have all this sin that we kept committing. And just out of ignorance, out of not knowing, and kept committing that sin simply because we didn't study the Word of God to know that it was sin. In other words, we have to stay with the Word of God as one of the last things that the Apostle Paul wanted to tell us and instruct to us as the church, as his writings to instructions of the church. Stay with the Word of God. Now, verse 3, Paul prophesies that a time will come that people will not want sound doctrine. In other words, what is sound doctrine? What is sound doctrine? People will not want that anymore. First, Sound doctrine is the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what is it that the four Gospels bring us? It brings us why Jesus came, and that yes, indeed, Jesus did come to this earth. He came to save sinners from a devil's hell. In other words, Satan is real. Hell is real. Sin is real. And we have a debt to pay. That debt to pay is death. That death is separation from God. Jesus brought us life and life eternal. He died in our place. He died with our sin upon Him who was guiltless, became guilty for us. He died for us. Is what the four Gospels teach us. Yet He rose again the third day. 
victorious over the sin debt that we pay, which is death. He removed our death from us so that we can live eternally with God. And the Bible tells us, and the four gospel tells us, that any person can do this. I know there are some organizations like Calvinism and other organizations that say, well, there's only a few that God chooses and selects. That's a lie from the devil himself. It tells us in the Gospels that Jesus came for whosoever and for all people. Everyone, Jesus belongs to you. No matter where you are in the world today, God sent Jesus for you. And it doesn't matter who your parents are or what sins that have been committed in your life. Jesus still died for you. That is what the four Gospels teach. That is sound doctrine. That is something that we need to understand that no matter what we've done or how many times we've done it, God is willing to forgive us through Jesus Christ no matter who we are. No matter who we are. Now, that is the first part of sound doctrine. The second part of sound doctrine is this. The epistles to the church. In other words, what was written for the church to begin. To be established. Groundwork, if you will. Foundation, if you will. For the church to begin with. And to grow. And to become mighty. And to become strong. Today, they say there's close to 2 billion Christians in the world today. That is a billion over what Islam is. Or a little more than a half a billion over what Islam is. Now, I would not agree that... There are 2 billion Christians. I would say there are probably a half billion, maybe, a half billion born-again Christians. That is what a Christian is. Everyone else, they're calling themselves Christians. It's a title. They like it. It's a religion. It's what they do. But it's not necessarily a born-again. Okay? But that is what the epistles is written to. Those who will follow Jesus Christ by the Word. In other words, by the Word of God. By the word of the letter, if you will, so to speak. I'm not talking about the letters for us the law. I'm talking about the word and the direction that God wants the church to go. So now, we see that that is sound doctrine. First, that we have a Savior. He came to this earth. He died for our sins. He rose again the third day, victorious over our debt, which we owe. Therefore, we can become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We can become one with Him, as in the eyes of God then we see that we're to start a powerful movement in the world. And it is to grow. But it is to have an establishment, a foundation, instructions, if you will, on how it is to do this. And that is the epistles. Folks, that is sound doctrine of what, yes, indeed, indeed, what God wants us to follow, what Paul is writing about. They will no longer endure sound doctrine. For example, we see now that a lot of churches do not teach that the blood of Jesus means a whole lot. In other words, you can work by your works. You can get saved. Or God chooses. Hey, Billy, you're saved. John, you're not. What do you need Jesus for in that case? Again, teaching against sound doctrine. They will not, it's what Paul is saying in verse 3, they will not want to hear it. He prophesied this would come. And folks, we're in a world today where that is not here. We're, we're, we're not seeing sound doctrine being preached like it should be preached. If there are 2 billion Christians in the world today, folks, it should only take us about 6 months to get the rest of the world saved. But, there's so much confusion and chaos and doctrine and what the Bible says that they cannot even understand what direction to go in to evangelize. It's like this local preacher here. I think the church is called Elevation. Okay, It's like these people in this Elevation church. They don't even teach sound doctrine anymore. They're going out to evangelize. Again, I say, evangelize what? If you're not taught what the doctrine is, how can you evangelize without doctrine? What is it you're telling people? God loves you? Well, guess what? The devil knows that God loves you. He knows that. And yes, any weirdo that's out here should know God loves them. Everybody should know that. If God didn't love us, He would destroy us, wouldn't He? I mean, He'd make us puppets. He'd make us slaves. We all know God loves us. But there's more to it. God loved us so much that He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for us. That's doctrine. And if you're not teaching how God done this, the whole process from the Old to the New Testament it is refreshing. It is reconfirming to us to know all this information. And again, they will move from it. They won't want it anymore. Just as you're seeing in our culture, in our society today. People are doing it. Now, sound teaching. 
First, the Gospels. Second, the Epistles. It's sound doctrine. Paul tells us people will change to make God into them. To make God into them. In other words, God will be what I am. In other words, I will not be what God is. God will be what I am. That's what I want. That's easier for me. And that's the way that I want to go. And there is where people is going. That's the place. That's where they're ending up. And folks, when that happens, and when the devil has, has painted this, this tapestry of deception upon the world in such a way that most of the world believes it, there's only one thing left for God to do, and that's to remove His true born-again people and to take them out of this world and to let this world have its deceptions. But Paul is prophesying that we must stay with the Bible. We must understand that most of the world will change and remove itself from the Bible. And it will even rewrite the Bible. ASVs, the Catholic Bible, the NIV Bible. All these Bibles will come about changing the Word of God simply because they do not want to endure or to stick with, if you will, the Word of God. They want to change it. They want God to be them and not them become like God. And folks, that is a dangerous place to be. Now, if you've got your Bible still, go to verse 4. And we'll read it again. Verse 4 states this, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. In other words, they will make up what they want to make up, and place it in the Bible, or in more literature that they will call part of the Bible. Jehovah Witness, Mormon, Calvinism, Catholicism, they're all doing it. They're all doing it. And you may say, brother, you're judging people. And you may think, that's what I'm doing. But I'm not. I'm telling you what Paul said. If Paul is judging people, then I am judging people. Then the Holy Spirit gave Paul the words, then the Holy Spirit is judging people. My job as a pastor is to tell the truth, and that's what I'm telling you today. Not judging anyone. I'm trying to help people from the deception that Satan is throwing upon them. How come is it that Satan will throw his deception upon people and anyone who challenges that deception is suddenly someone that goes around judging people? In other words, Satan wants me to shut up, doesn't he? He doesn't want me to tell the truth, does he? But folks, Paul tells us, the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit tells us, stick with sound doctrine, that people will come to a place where they want to turn the truth into fables. They'll say, hey, you can work and go to heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't teach it. Hey, God will only choose certain people. And those other people that He created, He's just going to send them to hell. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches for whosoever. You see what I'm saying, folks? Verse 4 tells us that they will go away from the truth and they'll go to fables, things that are made up, made up by false prophets. Men like John Calvin, John Russell, yeah, Brigham Young, all these people, Muhammad, all these people are false prophets trying to bring into fables where truth should be. Trying to bring these fables into where truth should be. We should not let truth go. The truth has already been established. The truth is the Word of God. And folks, we must stay with the Word of God as Paul tells us. Now, people will come to a place that they will purposely, and let me say it another way, they will on purpose want the truth gone. In other words, the truth bothers me. I don't like to hear the truth. It talks about a devil's hell. And if it talks about a devil's hell, that may mean that I can go there. And I don't want to think about that. So I'm going to remove the concept of hell just like Jehovah's Witnesses have done. I'm going to remove that concept. Or, I can work. I don't have to do what that Bible says about trusting in Jesus Christ as my Savior and confessing my sins. I don't really want to confess my sins because I want to continue to, to, uh, to do sins. I want, I want to have a sinful life. I don't want to confess them. If I confess them, that means i got to work on trying to stop them. That means I have to judge myself and my actions and what I'm doing that could be against God. I don't want to do that. The Word of God, folks, is like a two-edged sword. And yes, it can separate the soul from the spirit. And that's what the Bible tells us. That we have to realize that the Bible is the truth and that is the direction that we must strive to go into. We cannot try to separate from it. Again, Paul tells us that, that, out of all the things,
things that I'm going to write. And all the things that I have already written. And all the things that I've tried to accomplish in the name of Jesus Christ. That is one of the most important things of all. Because that is going to be the last thing that I ever write. To stay with sound doctrine. Again, in verse 3, Paul states, we must stick with the Bible. We have to. If we're going to be successful, true born-again Christians for God. We have to stick with the Bible. Verse 10, Paul points out that yes, some will leave. Not leave as far as salvation. You can't leave it, which is another false teaching. You can't leave salvation. Jesus said, no man will pluck you from my hand. Are you a man? Then you can't even pluck yourself from Jesus' hand. He said, no man will pluck you from my hand. But some will leave and backslide or go back into the world who are supposed to be true followers of Christ. And they are believers because they have received the gift of salvation. But the world is a little more entertaining for them. In other words, it has a little more pizzazz, a little more excitement for their flesh. And they're allowing the flesh to lead their spirit and their soul a little bit. And folks, they're doing this on purpose. There will be some that will do that. And Paul talks about some will do that. Does it mean they're going to hell? It just means that they have become a problem. And yes, they will lose rewards in heaven. I believe that while we're on this earth, we are earning the position that God will give us for eternity in heaven. In other words, there's going to be a thousand year millennium reign. The Bible clearly tells us that we will rule and reign with Him in that millennium. In other words, some people will be on top. Some people will be in charge. But if God can't trust you here and now with just a little bit of faithfulness to the Word of God, how can He trust you through eternity with a big, powerful position to rule and reign with Jesus Christ? Some will just have to fall in the ranks and be somewhere in the midst, if you will. And some will be in powerful positions. The last will be first. The first will be last. Just because some great evangelist is on television and he's speaking before great crowds does not mean that he in his heart believes or understands the truth of the Word of God. And it may mean that he could be down on the bottom somewhere even though he is in front of a lot of people. The ones that God is talking about is the ones that keep it solid in their heart. The sound doctrine, the truth, the Bible, if you will, and will not waver from it. That is who God's talking about. And that could be any of you listening today. You know, you could go out and witness to two or three people with a pure heart of trying to reach them for Jesus Christ and God will one day reward you greatly in heaven and put you on a high position of ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ forever. Just because you are sincere and true in your heart, that is what God is going by. Now, some, Paul tells, yeah, will fall away. Those, they will not receive anything. Verse 10, it talks about those that will fall away. And they will not receive much of anything. Oh, they'll go to heaven because they believe on Jesus Christ and the blood is not wasted. But they will not receive great things. But we who strive and who fight and endure, we who endure, we will receive a crown of victory. A crown of righteousness, if you will. And the Bible clearly tells that. In verse 8, it talks about a, a crown of righteousness that Paul says, he will receive and others will receive that endure until the very end. Paul is telling us, look, believe the Word of God. Stay with the Word of God. Endure to the end and you will receive a crown of righteousness. In other words, you will be placed in a position of power for eternity with Jesus Christ and not just somewhere in the ranks as a person who took advantage of the blood of Jesus Christ and got saved and then went and done what you wanted to do. God's not going to honor that. But He will honor those who endure, who strive, who stick with the Word of God. Those He will reward and He will put on a higher level. Yes, there are positions in heaven. The Bible clearly tells us this. Now, born again, this is a message for you today. Just a little longer. Hang on. Just a little longer. Endure. Just a little longer before Christ comes back and starts His thousand year millennium reign. Just a little longer. And you will have it all. It will all be behind you. Just a little longer. I believe that Jesus is coming real soon. Just a little longer. Hold on. Hold on. Don't let go. And you will see what Paul says is absolutely true. 
simply because the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this. I believe Paul got as in touch with the Holy Spirit as he could during this time in this dark cell. He, he tried his best to 100% be guided by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit 100% guided him in these words. This is God's instructions. This is God's way of telling us who are the born-again Christian, endure just a little bit longer, a little bit longer, before the thousand-year millennium reign begins, and you will see it was worth it all. All of it. All those that downplay you and dismiss you. All these great big religions who play us down and play us like the little insignificant groups. All that will be over with, and we will reign and rule with Jesus on Mount Zion for a thousand years upon this earth, and then for eternity in heaven. Just a little longer. Wait. It's coming. It's coming. Paul's words, absolutely, were from God. And God is telling us, absolutely, it could be just a little longer. Folks, I believe that we're in a time when most people who are watching me today will see that yes, the return of Jesus has happened. Has happened. I ain't saying it's happened yet. Don't get me wrong. But they will live long enough to see that it happened. In other words, when Jesus calls us from this earth to meet Him in the air, Seven years of tribulation on this earth, then we will come back down and rule and reign with Jesus, thus stopping Israel from being taken completely. We will save Israel. Jesus will step on the Mount of Olives. It will split open, and He'll walk through to the temple. It will burst. Then He'll go down to Mount Zion, and He'll set up His kingdom there. That's where we will rule and reign with Him, who endured just a little bit longer. Now, if you will, read verses 6 and 7. Read verses 6 and 7. It says this, but watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Verse 5. Endure, uh, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Verse 6 and then 7. Listen to it. It says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. In other words, our job is what Paul is telling us, is to fight the fight to the very end to finish our course, to never quit, to never slow down, to never give up, to never say, enough, they win. Okay, I get it. I'm going to join the massive organizations that seem to be striving and doing so well and everyone is so happy to be a part of. I'm going to go join those groups. No. The fight is not joining the easy parts. The fight is striving against what seems to be the easiest part. Fighting against it. And folks, there is where we have to separate ourselves from the world and joining what the world is doing in religions and, and ways and, and concepts and cultures and thoughts. We have to separate from this. And just a little longer, Jesus will return. Jesus will take us. Jesus will receive us unto Himself. And we will come back and we will rule and reign with Him for that thousand years. You know, Solomon stated, there is a time for every purpose under heaven. And right now, our purpose during this time is to endure just a little longer. Have you received Christ today as your Savior? Are you truly born again? Are you truly committed to the Word of God and sound doctrine and sound teaching? Are you sincerely striving for what the Bible says to be the ways of the world? may never be accomplished until the thousand years. Until after the thousand years. But strive for it now and God will reward you with it forever and for eternity later. Endure. Receive Christ. Strive for what is true, what is right. And I promise you today can change your eternity.